Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week and to sharing some practical security advice along the way. I'm your host and big-time security nerd, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting October 13th, 2014. Let's dive right into our three stories, starting with Patch Day, and my goodness, it was a huge patch day with updates from Microsoft, Adobe, Oracle, and more I'll talk about later. Let's start with Microsoft Patch Day on Tuesday. Microsoft released eight security bulletins. This was actually one less than they originally promised. Three of the bulletins were critical and the rest were rated as important. And overall, they fixed 24 vulnerabilities. While 24 doesn't seem like a lot of vulnerabilities, this was actually a very, very important patch day. In fact, it actually fixed three zero-day vulnerabilities which are being exploited in the wild. The fixes came out for Internet Explorer, uh, Windows, the .NET framework, the .ASB framework, and, and other products like that. The biggest vulnerabilities were the critical ones. There's uh, some big Internet Explorer updates that fix some remote code execution. There's actually also a Windows vulnerability that had to do with how Windows processed true type fonts. And this is a zero-day flaw that bad guys were exploiting in the wild. There's also a vulnerability in Windows's object linking and embedding. And they actually rated this vulnerability only as important. However, this was a big vulnerability too, since it's actually being used in an attack campaign that's being called Sandworm. And Sandworm is really a story all on its own. I don't have time to talk about it this week, but it is a allegedly Russian malware attack campaign that's targeting NATO, the Ukraine, and some Western governments. And it largely seems to spread with malicious PowerPoint uh, documents that seem to take advantage of this OLE or object linking and embedding vulnerability to execute code on victims computers. And there are many other big Microsoft vulnerabilities. So in short, if you're using Windows, Office Word, uh, Internet Explorer.NET Framework or ASP.NET, I highly recommend you check out Microsoft Patch Day. Definitely apply all the critical patches right away and also apply MS14060, which is the important update that fixes the sandworm vulnerability. On top of that, Adobe shares Microsoft Patch Day and they released a Cold Fusion update. This is a popular web application server. That update fixed three vulnerabilities, including some local privilege elevation flaws and some cross site scripting flaws. But more importantly, Adobe released a Flash Player update that fixed three critical remote code execution flaws. So if you use Flash, bad guys can use this in drive by download attacks just by enticing you to a site with malicious Flash on it. Finally, Oracle released their quarterly critical patch update or CPU for October 2014 and this was massive. This update included fixes for 155 security vulnerabilities in a ton of products. Anything from their database servers to Java to Sun to CRM software. The most important updates are probably in the Oracle database servers and for users the updates for Java. Java fixed around 25 vulnerabilities that can allow remote attackers to execute code again just by enticing you to malicious websites. So again if you're a Microsoft, Adobe, or Oracle uh, customer be sure to get all those updates. And by the way this isn't the end of the patching news this week. Later I'll share another story that will require a patch. For the second story this week, I want to talk about the risk in allowing third-party apps to have access to your cloud or web services. And this is because there were two stories this week involving some big data leaks. The first happened over the weekend and is being called the Snappening. On sites like 4chan, people were sharing 12 to 13 gigabytes of Snapchat images and videos. And at the beginning, some people thought Snapchat had been hacked. As it turned out, a third-party service called Snapsave.com which a user gives access to their Snapchat credentials was actually the culprit. Bad guys had somehow breached the Snapsave.com network and stolen just tons and tons of images that were being saved by Snapchat. 
The second incident involves Dropbox. On Pastebin, an anonymous attacker released a list of leaked Dropbox credentials. And at first people thought, again, that maybe Dropbox themselves was hacked. And the, the particular attacker said they had around 7 million other credentials that they were willing to sell for Bitcoin. However, later in the week, Dropbox confirmed that the breach was not to their network. Rather, third-party services which you give permission to access your Dropbox application giving them your credentials were the culprit again. Bad guys were able to use these third-party services to get some of these credentials. And by the way, since then, Dropbox has identified and blocked and reset the affected credentials. So Dropbox users shouldn't be affected today. In either case, both these scenarios show the risk you take when you let a third-party application have access to one of your resources. Every time you install a Facebook application, for instance, that says, uh, do you want this application to have access to your friends in your profile, you're actually giving it credential access to your Facebook account, at least for some resources. And this could turn into an eventual data breach, not through Facebook directly, but through this third-party app. So the tip here is simple. When you're seeing third-party apps ask for access to web services, you really need to consider this. You need to consider what type of data that you share with this web service, and if this app is really worth the risk you're taking if there's some sort of flaw that will give the bad guy access to your real cloud application. So the final and biggest story this week is a very dangerous poodle. <laughs> Actually, I jest, and the poodle is not as dangerous as the media made it seem at first. Poodle refers to a new vulnerability that's affecting SSL connections, specifically SSL version 3 type connections. Poodle stands for Padding Oracle on Downgraded Legacy Encryption. And uh, three Google researchers basically found a weakness in one of the encryption uh, implementations used by SSL TLS connections. And SSL, of course, is one of the encryption standards you can use for network communication. It's most often associated with secure websites. SSL version 3 suffers from a pretty technically complex cryptographic vulnerability. I won't explain it in a ton of technical detail, but if you want to read about it, I'll be sure to have a link to the research paper associated with it. But here's kind of how it works. First of all, for a bad guy to be able to exploit this, they have to perform a man-in-the-middle attack. They have to be able to get between you and the secure server you're communicating with. This can be really hard or really easy depending on the circumstances. For instance, on the internet, this is really hard. If you have a connection, a hard connection to your ISP on the internet, for a bad guy to actually get between you and your ISP or a particular server is, is difficult. They either have to use something like DNS poisoning, which is not easy to do, there's no vulnerabilities out there right now for it, or they have to have like NSA level uh, ISP interception capabilities. On the flip side, if you join any unsecured Wi-Fi networks or untrusted access points, a bad guy can easily intercept all your traffic and do a man-in-the-middle attack. So do know the man-in-the-middle aspect of this vulnerability does lessen the severity when you're not on open Wi-Fi networks. In any case, if a bad guy can get between you and a secure server connection, his first task is to try to force you and that server to speak SSL v3. Now that might sound hard, but it's actually very easy. SSL standards have a special feature that allows a server and a client to negotiate how they're going to encrypt traffic. If the server doesn't support one type of encryption uh, that the client's trying, they both keep on talking to, to agree on what communication mechanism to use. In this particular man-in-the-middle attack, it's pretty tricky trivial for the attacker to intercept this negotiation process and to force you and the server to speak SSL v3. Once the bad guys force the SSL v3 connection, his next step is to actually take advantage of this, this complex flaw that has to do with how uh, SSL v3's CBC ciphers do padding. And I won't go into all the technical details, but in a nutshell, the bad guy has to do these educated guesses and to, to manipulate packets in a certain way. And on average, the researchers found it takes uh, 1 in 256 different guesses for the bad guy to get enough information to decrypt one byte of your SSL communication. However, once he's decrypted that one byte, it's pretty easy for him to then decrypt that particular SSL session. 
Now to do this, the attacker has to force the client to send the same information up to 256 times. This seems like it might be hard to do. However, if the attacker is targeting a web browser, because again, SSL is used usually for secure web communication, and he has a man in the middle attack, he can inject JavaScript that will silently essentially get your browser to do what he needs over and over in the background. However, the point I'm trying to make here, though, is it's pretty easy to exploit this vulnerability against web browsers, getting them to retry things over and over 256 times. But this type of exploit is not going to work well against other type of SSL clients, like VPN clients, or maybe the built-in iPhone Twitter app. Those things don't run JavaScript, so an attacker is going to have a hard time getting them to resend the data he needs many times to perform this particular attack. In any case, once the bad guys encrypted some of this session, what can he do with it? Well, ultimately, as they're targeting web browsers, these bad guys really probably want to steal your HTTP session cookie. And this is really a cookie that allows them to hijack your session and basically do anything you can do on a secure website. They won't have your password for the website, but of course they can pretty much do anything you can do on that secure website, whether it be change your banking information, make a payment, or, or uh, administered uh, a web interface. So, decrypting SSL traffic is a big deal. This is a big vulnerability in that regard. However, the mitigating circumstances, the fact that this requires a man-in-the-middle attack, it only can really target web browsers, these things really kind of lessen the severity a bit and make this harder to actually uh, exploit in the real world. And that's why the CVSS score for this vulnerability is only 4.3 out of 10. So despite all the media articles telling you how bad this flaw is, it's actually only a medium severity. You should definitely fix it, but it's not that horrible. So how do you fix it? There's actually two parts to this equation. There's the server and the client issue. Both servers and clients can use SSL v3 and be vulnerable. Now the good news is you only have to patch or fix one side of that equation and you fix the vulnerability. Right now, my recommendation is to focus on the client aspect of this attack and fix your web browsers. All the web browsers, whether it's Chrome, uh, Safari, uh, Internet Explorer, have ways to allow you to disable SSL v3 encryption. In fact, I'll put a link in the blog post associated with this video that give you instructions on how to do this. If you disable SSL v3 in your browser, you're not vulnerable to this. Even if the server you're connecting to supports SSL v3, bad guys can use this to decrypt your traffic. So fix your browsers first. That said, you want to fix your servers as well. By patching your server, you're kind of protecting the rest of the world. The folks out there that don't patch their browser, you're protecting them from being snooped on. Uh, to fix your server is a little bit more complicated. In most cases, you're probably using OpenSSL for your, for instance, secure web communications. OpenSSL has released a patch for this that both allows you to disable SSL v3 by default, and it also uh, supports a feature that makes it harder for attackers to downgrade that negotiation and to force you to use any sort of particular encryption. So if you use OpenSSL, go get that fix. And do know that this will affect any SSL uh, TLS implementation, whether it be GNU uh, uh, SSL or whatever, because this is a SSL v3 uh, protocol vulnerability, not a particular software vulnerability. So go out and get the proper Linux updates or SSL TLS Im implementation updates. Now the final part of this story Story is watch card customers might wonder, does this affect them? And the short answer is yes, it does. Watch guard appliances, whether they be the XTM, the XCS, or the SSL VPN appliance, all use OpenSSL or SSL to encrypt stuff. Now, the good news is this threat poses a relatively low risk. It mostly affects our web administrative interfaces and our web client portals. For instance, the XTM appliance's web interface will allow SSL v3 support. However, you can easily mitigate this. There's really no reason to expose your administrative interface for your security appliance on the internet. If you restrict access to this interface, people won't even have access to it to try to do this man-in-the-middle attack. On top of that, if you fix your browser, if you disable SSL VPN in your browser, even if it's still uh, on the WatchGuard appliance, people can't exploit this attack against you when you actually uh, configure through your 
your browser. So this does affect our appliances. The good news is our engineers are working on fixes. They'll be coming out over the next few days and weeks. So be sure to check out our blog to know when the fixes are coming. So in summary, this is a significant issue, but it's not as big as Heartbleed, and it's certainly not as big as some of the media makes it seem. You do want to disable SSL v3. We don't want to use that encryption protocol anymore. It's basically broken. Definitely disable it in your browser right away. But you can take some time to start patching the server and, and understand the implications of applying these OpenSSL and other SSL updates. Uh, it's going to be hard for bad guys to really exploit this in the real world. And if we do a good job of patching our browser or, or, or disabling SSL v3 in our browser, they really can't exploit this against us. Finally, I do want to mention most of the browser vendors have already promised to, to disable SSL v3 by default in their next release. So even though you can manage manually disable it now. Once you update your browser in, in a few days or weeks, chances are v3 is going to be disabled around the internet very, very quickly. So that's it for this week's episode, but my goodness, I barely scratched the surface of the stories out there. This was a very busy security week, so be sure to check the reference section in our blog post associated with this video. While you're at it, if you want to get early information about these sorts of stories, be sure to follow the WatchGuard Security Center blog. I have a very in-depth Poodle post, for instance, which came up this week, and you can see it there whenever you want. Finally, you can follow me on Twitter, I'm at SecAdept, or follow WatchGuard at WatchGuardTech. As always, Thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.